one. Okie dokie, so, I don't know what this is, I don't know why this popped up on my screen, it's not at, that's not at all the video we need, you need to refresh your ass, refresh, you refresh that ass, better refresh yourself or you check yourself, mm-hmm, okay, so, alright, so, Breaking news in the MMA community, uh, as of, I believe, 4.43 a.m., um, as of Thursday, March 26, today, uh, the UFC light heavyweight champion of the world, uh, Johnny Bones Jones, has just been arrested and released uh, for his second uh, DWI charge. Uh, Lincoln, I know that, uh, by the way, I'm Garrett, my host Lincoln. I'm so sorry. I'm so excited about this. Yeah, we, I, I skipped the introductions earlier, but as you guys can see on the screen right now, I'm playing, uh, some of the, uh, police footage, uh, from the, uh, initial encounter. Uh, it's, uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you can kind of see a pretty aggravated, uh, John Jones uh, sitting in a sports car of his as the police officer is being a, a rather uh, stern officer uh, in relation to some of John Jones's, uh, I guess, attitude uh, displays, is if there's any other way to, to refer to it. I mean, when you got a history, the cops are going to be very nice to you. Exactly. It's, it's, and especially if... Um, You've had the kind of charges uh, someone like John Jones has as often as he's had them. So basically, uh, for the uninitiated, welcome. We uh, talk about MMA stuff, and because there hasn't been a whole lot of MMA stuff, everybody, including MMA legends, have decided to go out and do some crazy stuff. So basically, for the uninitiated, John Jones is arguably one of the greatest of all time. He's pretty much undefeated in every fight. And he, I think, has now beaten the title defense record uh, with George St. Pierre. Yeah. So, now he's, uh, he just fought, this past February, he just fought, he just beat Dominic Reyes via unanimous decision victory. And as you guys can see here, he is getting arrested. Uh, Basically, Lincoln, I, I told you about this before we had started recording, but I, did, I left out some of the details. Well, let me hear some of the details, big boy. I'm ready. Yeah, so I'm basically just I'm going to go over these uh, for you guys. Uh, I'll also have the uh, police report pulled up right here. It's a little small. Uh, you might have to pause and uh, look it up uh, for yourself. Go check it out. Uh, this one, initially, that I have on screen is from... KOAT Action News, uh, they were my first source, and then, of course, MMA Junkie uh, got on top of that as soon as they could and got their hands on the police report. Uh, so that's what we're seeing right here in front of us, is the official report. Basically, I'm going to go back over to the uh, original article and just kind of go over what had happened. Uh, at around 1 a.m. Uh, this morning, a uh, police officer had, uh, according to the... Um, video, there's some, there's some interesting things that they leave out of the actual report and then what's in the video itself, uh, but basically the major gist here is that uh, John Jones uh, was, well no, the basic gist is that the police uh, received a report that uh, there were sh uh, gunshots being fired uh, around uh, 3rd Street and Central Avenue in John Jones's hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the police respond, and they get to the area, and I believe we see, the, the police officer in the video claims he sees John Jones um, take off uh, trying to race a Cadillac, or drag race a uh, Cadillac in his uh, sports car, uh, to which John Jones takes off from a, I guess, like a set point, speeds up. The police officer obviously, yeah. The police officer flashes his lights, obviously flags him down, and then now 
you know, as you guys can see on screen, I have the video playing and the police officer is talking to John Jones. He's asking for, you know, different uh, forms of registration, his, his insurance and his driver's license. John Jones is having, from from what I heard, what the way I heard is his tone. He's having a bit of an attitude about it, and the police officer is calling him out on said attitude. Uh, so we already have a pretty aggravated case here. John Jones, kind of in the video, looks like he's slurring over his words a little bit. He seems a little disheveled, as if he's been drinking. And uh, come to find John out, Jones? yeah, right, John Jones drinking what? Um, the party animal himself? Yeah, right? Like, let's just see here. Uh, yeah, so basically, police found Jones in his car, asked him about the about the gun firings. He said he didn't know anything about that. He said he didn't hear nothing about that. Um, they asked him if he's been drinking. He takes a breathalyzer test. He tests twice above the legal limit. Uh after Jones was arrested, police found a black handgun under the driver's seat and, and a half-empty bottle of Ricardo or Ricardo 750 mil uh, behind the behind the passenger seat. That's exactly what you don't want when you get pulled over for racing. Yeah. Uh, so basically, so did they find out what the gun shots were? They believed that it was him. They believe he was shooting a gun as well. They, yeah, they had they found the handgun under his under his seat. So basically, but he was just like there wasn't like bullet holes in anything. Like he was just shooting it. it yeah, I think what it, it it wasn't like he was trying to hit somebody with it. I think it was just he was wiling out, got himself a just gun. In the air or something. Yeah, it was just was just being reckless uh, with it and the official police report that I have here on the screen uh, that you guys can see is um, he was charged with uh, four things he was charged with no proof of insurance so he didn't have insurance in the vehicle um, there's actually an interesting point in the video I have here on the original page where he actually does hand the officer something that he says is proof of insurance um, but I guess it, it wasn't proof of insurance or it was something that he thought was proof of insurance or it could have been that John Jones was just really drunk and was just grabbing pieces of paper and saying, here, this is what here's what you're looking for and yada, yada, yada. I mean, I, I done that sober when I got pulled over and I just handed him, like, every piece, every slip of paper that was in my glove box. Yeah, it, it, it's a little, uh... Things back. Yeah, it's a little, uh... It's a little, uh, interesting... Um, because the video doesn't necessarily do that great a job giving you context to what's going on. Because cause when I look at John Jones and I see that he's you know freaking out over the papers in his car, I'm like, that's me, you know, that's you, that's me, that's all of us. Um, he was then charged with aggravated DWI one, uh, so his second offense in in that regard. Uh, he was then charged with negligent use of firearms. Uh, you know, just shooting him off in the air down in New Mexico. Uh, and then he was finally charged with possession of open container of alcohol. So he got he got four big bugaboos there, basically. Four biggins, but guess what's going to happen? What? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Probably nothing. I, he, I think he's got, it says, I think it says somewhere here, he's got an arraignment or some kind of hearing he's got to go to on the 8th of April, right here. According to Albuquerque's Metropolitan Detention Center current inmate list, Jones no longer is in custody. Bernalillo, New Mexico County District Attorney's Office, Office Director of Communications, Michael Patrick, told MMA Junkie in a statement that Jones will have a bond arraignment hearing on April 8th. So that's basically when that is going to take hold. Uh, that's when he's going to, um, you know, I guess deal with that. Uh, just a quick run through of some of the previous offenses our boy Johnny Bones has been involved with. And it all, it basically, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's as if this has never happened before. And I'm not more shocked. Uh, but, but it basically all started in 2012. Uh, where he avoided uh, jail time on a misdemeanor, uh, his first DWI charge uh, caused by running his Bentley into a utility pole uh, in New York. That was pretty, 
that was pretty televised. Um, that was kind of like his first instance of oh man, you know, fame's getting to him. Um, yeah, maybe he shouldn't be driving. Yeah, and then maybe at this point he should just be taxiing around. Yeah, in 2015, he was involved in a hit and run that left a pregnant woman with a broken arm and resulted in him being stripped of his UFC title for the first time. <laughs> The first time he got stripped of his title. Uh, then we have here, after that, you know, he served all the stuff he was supposed to serve. Uh, in March 2016, he had a highly publicized traffic stop in which he engaged in a verbal back and forth with an Albuquerque police officer after yet again being accused of drag racing. This, this current event that happened today was just his second time. Uh, of being accused of drag racing. And then this uh, past September in uh, 2016, uh, Jones was hit with a alleged uh, uh, battery charge for slapping a waitress at a strip club, but not just slapping her, choking her, kissing her, and touching her after she had asked him to stop. I had never heard of that one until just now. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know how. Honestly, like, I think that was something that, um... I feel like that's a little bit worse than some of the other ones. Yeah, that one... The pregnant lady. I mean, it was, uh... I don't know what really came of it. He didn't really seem to serve any time. The only thing that really happened is, uh... He received some... He pleaded no contest. Um, which I'm not necessarily familiar with the legal terms for that. <laughs> It just means that you, you're like you're not arguing that it did happen. But then nobody's saying that it did happen. Is basically what I'm yeah, hearing. It's yeah. one of those things where you're just like, uh, I, I'm not saying I didn't do it. And then they're, they, they pretty much they just the the defense or the people that are against you then decide what they want to do. So I'm pretty sure they settled. They would have had to settle it outside the court. So I'm sure he just paid them off. Yeah. Which is what happens a lot of the time, especially, like, most of the time when somebody sees a no contest, then, like, either they serve jail time or, like, the thing is lesser because they didn't drag it out and, like, waste all the government dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, pretty interesting. Like, early on, because then if, it, if, like, the same thing happened, but it was, like, a year of court battlings, and then he said, oh, I play no contest now, they would have been like, no! No, Now you're going to do it for, like, 12 years. Fuck you for wasting this time. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, so that was, uh... It just proves that a tattoo on his chest, is, it means everything. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's like... Man. You know what that tattoo, tattoo means? The Philippians? Yeah, tattoo? Philippians 4.13. No, I personally do not know. It's it's something along the lines of I can do all things through Christ as he strengthens me or something. Mm, okay. Yeah, that, and you're just, you're just like, yep, yeah, that sounds about right, John. That's kind of the persona he puts out there, you know. Um, more recently... See, I thought whenever he came back and beat Justice in it, and then the the two fight, the three fights after that, I almost, I almost had it wrong, but he fought three times, four times since he's been back, yeah. including Justice in it. And I thought, you know, maybe he's finally learned his lesson. And then he, he texted me this, and I said, no way! Yeah. On a tangent. Yeah, apparently, I mean, this was unbeknownst to me that throughout pretty much the entirety of 2019, he had been fighting uh, the case with the stripper in the club um, that he had apparently abused in multiple different ways, verbally, physically, that was, that sexually. Was last year? Huh? He did that last year? That apparently started in, like, April of 2019. And then Jones, Jesus Jones, I never even think about that one. Dude, Jeez. dude Jones himself. That's one of those things that they had done like in the earlier parts of his career and just swept it under. No, apparently Jones himself wasn't even aware that there was a warrant out for his arrest until July. <laughs> so the best worst guy ever. Ever in the history. It's like, and it's almost, it's something, it's something so interesting to me, because it almost makes me just want to understand. It's like, it's like he's, he's, he's undefeated, 
He's got the whole world eating out of the palm of his hands. He wins fights, you know. He he goes out there and he puts on, you know, some of the best performances any MMA fighter could ever hope to put on. Has one of the greatest winning streaks that the UFC has ever seen in its entirety. He's out here breaking records of some of the people who we normally typically think of when we think of the GOATs, you know, George St. Pierre, Anderson Silva, all these different guys. He's he's now on that level with those guys, undeniably, when, in the terms of the sport. But then it's like, for whatever reason, because of that lack of competition, because of that lack of any kind of real drive when it comes to, you know, the profession that he embodies... It's like he just can't help himself but indulge in the alcohol, indulge in the vices, indulge in what I dare say is his evil side. He has, he's, he's a very dark individual, and that is in the sense of, you know, he comes out and he puts on this persona of, you know, being the righteous choir boy that is just coming out here to do the best he can, you know? But at the end of the day, there's something, when, he, when things like this happen, and then you look at, you know, the things he says on camera, there's something that just comes off as very disingenuous about the whole thing. It's almost like he has, like, the, like, people make their own reality type of thing. Yeah. So he's got, like, the persona of he's the choir boy, he's the, he's the goody two-shoes who can never do anything wrong. And that persona in and of itself is just so that people won't believe it when something like this happens. Yeah. They're like, oh, it was just, one, it was just a bad day. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's pretty insane. Um, yeah, I don't even... I can't even really... <laughs> I just... The firearms is a new one for me because I didn't think that he would, he would be like just, you know, just misusing a firearm of that. Of just that out in the open. Like that. Yeah, just out of the open street racing and shooting guns. I mean, dude, let's really think about what it here. I, Go ahead. What if, what if he wasn't shooting, like, what if they were using the gun as, like, the ready, set, go? Who knows? Um, I don't know. I don't know. get up races sometimes? Yeah, but I don't know why it would necessarily be in the driver's car. Because he just so had, he, like, if he just had one. He just said, he just hey, just guys. I it got, was just like, all right, I'm going to shoot this in the air. There we go. Yeah. And then they did that like a few times. I could see. I could see something. I could see something like that happen. But at the end of the day, that is still technically a negligent use of the firearm because you shoot those you shoot, you shoot those bullets up in the air. They're bound to come back down on somebody's house. You know. Somewhere. Somewhere, and 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 really, you know. Some people are going to be out there and they're going to say, "Hey, you know, none of this is none of this is true." Blah blah blah. People are just trying to bring John Jones down. Guys, look at the facts. Look at the look at the past history. Look at the evidence here. I understand that, especially in, in recently, John Jones has been trying to put out this idea that you can't you can't you can't judge somebody based on you know their past grievances the past uh, negativities that they've perpetuated, that they've basically made people understand about them. Well, uh, buddy, <laughs> you know, you, you make it really hard for us to not hold those things against you when you are a habitual, repeated offender. It'd be different if you did it, if something like this happened once years ago, and oh, yeah. just like, I wouldn't be stop bringing it up. But, like, it's happened, like... You've had multiple instances, and those are just the ones we know about. Exactly. He's constantly dealing with probation. He's constantly having these different trials. I mean, he's got, he's constantly involved in something, and it's it's kind of at a point where um, you have to wonder. Drug test. Oh yeah, and and not to mention you know his discrepancies in in his professional career as well, having been stripped twice uh, of his. Um, of his UFC title, uh, one of those times being, um, am I thinking that correctly? Was one of those times? Well, the first time was because of his um, DWI, right? And then his first one, and then his, the second one was because he um, t 
tested positive in his rematch with DC, or was that was it stripped the first time from him when he hit that pregnant woman? Because I know the second time was when he rematched DC. I think he only got stripped once. No, I'm pretty sure he was definitely stripped twice. But um, then, uh, then it would have to be uh, those. I don't know in accordance where what what happened first or whatnot, but it had to be either of those. I'm literally looking it up right now. <laughs> I was under the assumption that he was only a two-time champion, but he might be a three-time champion. Okay. How many times has John Jones been stripped of the title? Yeah, this is when we need a Jamie. Oh my god. <laughs> I know, I mean, guys, I know I'm using Wikipedia, but... They hold, uh, they hold the most... Okay, so basically... He was he he has lost the belt and regained it three times. All right. Jones was expected to defend his title against Anthony Johnson uh, in 2015. I remember that one. So that one was the one. That was the hit and run incident. That was when he hit the pregnant woman. That was the first time. And then the second one was his rematch with Daniel Cormier. Wait 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 wait. wait, wait. Yes, so, th so that was the, I believe that was the rematch with Daniel Cormier. Because I remember that one got moved to a no contest or something. No, no, okay, so, so between, so between, this is so, this is so ridiculous, and I, and I'm, I'm, I love getting to try and explain this to the, to the uninitiated and the guys that are just following this with us, um, but, oh, real quick. Um, so the first time was when he hit, hit that pregnant lady, and the second time was, uh, uh, when they had scheduled the rematch with Daniel Cormier, but Jones had to pull out because he tested positive. And he tested positive, and he had to be suspended for one year. And so then he got stripped of his title the second time. Um, and then that's when he had to. That's when he went through, and he fought guys like Dan Henderson and Chell Sonnen, I believe. Um, yeah. And then the third time was when he fought Daniel Cormier. He rematched Daniel Cormier. He fought and recaptured it from Daniel Cormier. However, after the fight, um, uh, yeah, I see. It was then announced that. Us Usada had he had been he had tested positive, but that was the time where the picograms came into effect. Yeah, that's when, that's when he was picogram. Yes. So basically, that's kind of that's that that's that whole little section there uh, for you guys. Um, first time, second time, third time. Basically, you're looking at a guy who is not clean. He is not. He is. He does not have clean hands. You're looking at a guy with a lot of dirty laundry. He's airing out. Um, I don't know. That's kind of awesome. yeah. I don't know what else you have to say on that specific uh, subject, but that's kind of all I got. I mean, that's all I got. It seems every time that I decide to praise John Jones, he just gives me a finger. So I'm done. Yeah. So anyway, every time I'm like, "Oh, he's coming back. He's one of the best. He's gonna do great." No, he's just a bad dude. He's just all. But it's it's hard. Go ahead. It, it, it really is hard to root for someone when they're just an ass. So I'm 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 bumping it. I'm bumping this tab off of my browser. We're done with Jones for the day. So basically, now I've got some lighter stuff that we're just gonna go over. That was more of the very abrupt, hard hitting news that we just got today. So I had to. I had to. I felt the need to cover that. Um, so basically, uh, I just wanted to go over a few different things here, um, t talking about you know some upcoming uh, stuff we got going on in relation to the UFC 249. Uh, I've got pulled up on the screen here. If it'll refresh, I have got. Okay, so this is the uh, coronavirus update. We've basically got from Dana White. This is the most recent one. 
that he has done. Um, writing this down real quick. That he has uh, given us. He basically has been very adamant recently saying that um, the card is definitely going to happen. He says he knows where it is going to happen, but he won't tell anyone. Do what? Dana? Yeah, exactly. I think I think it's one of those things he might be trying to build up anticipation for because if he announces where the card is going to be held, then it's like he has to announce the whole thing at once. And I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to build up uh, high amounts of anticipation uh, for this bout because uh, he came out uh, in, the, in the past few days and has been saying that he's trying to build one of the baddest cards um, of the year, you know, in, 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 in the UFC that they've had in a while. He's trying to build up this card as going to be one of the best cards, you know, the UFC has had in a while. And he's really trying to, um, he's really trying, he, in a world where the most live sports have pretty much all been, excuse me? What? I thought I heard something. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but basically, in a world where I think that's a little bit. okay, um, my face. It's, it's a big cough. It's not a corona cough. I promise. Oh, okay, good. Good thing you're on the phone, or else I would have hung up. You know. <laughs> um, anyway, basically, Dan White has been saying um, that. Fuck! I lost my complete train of thought. You ass. I'm sorry. I tried. I moved the phone away. I tried to hide it. Oh my just god. Like oh my god. I don't know why I had to call you out on that. So Vicky's got his card. Dana White's not trying to tell anybody where it is so he can build it up. Oh, Vicky's yeah. got a million yet and he's just trying to trick everybody so that the anticipation stays there. Yes, because I, I was actually going to say that. That's good that you brought that up because that actually does bring me back on my, my train of thought there. Um, because you. Thank you. Uh, basically, in a world where all live sports have essentially shut down, Dana White is trying to get ahead of the curve, and he's trying to really propel his platform uh, onto another playing field. You know, he's really trying to elevate the status of the UFC and be able to put forth uh, such a great and amazing card amongst um, troves and troves of just inactivity. You know, and and it's pretty funny because when he he was being interviewed, I believe it was. Kevin Eol that I have pulled up here. Um, I don't know how you pronounce that, but he, he gets he gets some pretty good interviews. And he was interviewing Dana White, and he basically said, "Hey Dana, um, you know, for all the struggling people out there, you know, that are having financial problems, are you going to cut the price of UFC 249 pay per view?" And you know what he said? He said, "Hell no." He said, "Hell no." <laughs> Exactly, and, and and I don't have it pulled up, but this was actually something really interesting. You guys should also check this out as supplemental inf uh, information, you know, as your homework going home from uh, today's lecture. One of the things that I think you should actually go look up is that the UFC has actually had to have massive amounts of layoffs and cutbacks uh, in terms of their staff. I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how severe it is, but that should really give you an idea of where the UFC is at. Because the UFC, Dana White, is going to try and put off this persona that they're doing great and that, you know, the pandemic that's going on right now is, you know, just another thing to to create hiccups in the plan. You know, Dana White's trying to make it seem like this is an every week occurrence that he handles all the time. But the reality is showing through when you when articles like what I just mentioned pop up and say the UFC is having to fire a lot of people, and the reason the UFC is having to fire a lot of people is because of the staff restrictions. You know how many people are allowed in one room, um, how many you know they're not able to make these events the way they typically would make them, and the UFC. Oh, excuse me. The UFC is struggling because of it, you know, financially, and so it would make. Golly, excuse me. I got the hiccups. Um, What's that? I said, golly, excuse me. I got the hiccups. Goodness. Uh, but but it makes sense that the UFC 
uh, President Dana White is not going to reduce the price uh, of the pay-per-view because at the end of the day, um, they're losing a lot of money on this because if you think about it, um, a lot of bars, a lot of bars, as you know, um, I'm in Knoxville uh, currently, you're in Chattanooga, I know you told me that they uh, passed uh, legislation down there to get all the bars to temporarily close, the same thing in Knoxville. You know, and, yeah, and that's, like a few days before y'all did. Yeah, exactly. It, but it, but it was all in pretty rapid succession. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the country, but I can tell you right now that the UFC is going to be losing out on a lot of pay per view buys when it comes to bars because not that many people are going to be wanting to go. Uh, bars aren't even open, so bars aren't even buying the pay per view, and that's where people go most of the time to watch those pay per views. That's where I went to go watch. Um, Mazadal v. Diaz. That's where I went to go watch Cowboy v. Cerrone. And I'm and dude, I'm telling you, um, people go to those things, and that causes that creates business for bars. That creates business for the UFC. Um, but with all bars pretty much closed across the country, the UFC is not getting that pay per view money. And then at the end, they the, no money. Yeah, and then they're also on top of that, they're not making any gate. They're not making any money from ticket sales. So they're so uh, it makes it makes a lot of sense, um, and I and I commend it. You know, some people would try to be you know they would try to go soft, maybe take off like five ten bucks. Dana White says, "Hell no, nah, I'm raising the price." He <laughs> <laughs> says they're 120 a buy now. Yeah, right. I don't know if he's. These guys can't gather more than groups of ten, so at least three of those people that would have been there have to go home and buy it themselves now. Yeah, I I doubt he he'll actually raise the price, but he but he. No, he, I don't think he will either. But you know, can just imagine him just going full Trump, going, no, hundred and fifty. Yeah. You guys want to you guys want to keep whining? One eighty. Keep yeah. going. I can do this all day. Yeah. And, and, and here's the, in, in relation to where they're going to actually have UFC 249. I have an idea. You have an idea? Good. Because I don't really have anything concrete. I don't really have any concrete theories. Um, there's so many theories going on right now, I don't really know which way to look. So what do you got? So my idea is if you wanted to do the whole entire card, right? Yeah. And you couldn't have that because like 12 fights or so times... Two, there's 24 people just there as the fighters. Uh huh. So if you're doing it like that, what if you just shoot the fights and each fight is at a different location at like a gym or one of the UFC places that they have? What if you just shoot them all separately and just go from one to the next? Like maybe you have them fight at, at different times and you already know what's going to happen and you have it recorded. So, like, go to each other's gyms, stuff like that, have it all sanitized, only have, like, a ref and, like, the camera crew there, and then, obviously, the fighters, and then just do it like that. Yeah, but then you got to take into account, like, the coaches, you know, the corner team and stuff. I know, just, like, limit it to, like, one corner man per person, and then, like, have one cut guy for both of them. I mean, hey, uh, I've, I mean, it would be crazy, but, you know, cra- is, these, or, are cra- these are crazy times. Or, I really, uh, Joe Rogan and Bert Kreischer or somebody were talking about it the other day. Uh-huh. I believe it was yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I believe. And they were saying about the Abu Dhabi um, option. Yeah. How that, and they were just like, what if we just, ask, what if like Dana White just went up and asked one of the, like, the rich sheiks there to do it like on their property, property or in their mansion and stuff, and just have it sanitized, and like, he, he was, they were all just like, the sheiks would start like fighting over who, get, who got to host the thing. Yeah, because Khabib is huge, Khabib is huge over in that side of the world. Exactly, they all love him. Yeah. That makes sense. I could see something like that happen. That's what I've heard. That's some of the different other theories I've heard fluctuating around. I've heard people say that this, this is what we talked about last week in the podcast when we brought up how Number Demetov's father um, mentioned having it over in like Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, really anywhere over in the Saudi you know areas. That could work. We can make that work. We can do that. Or UFC, UFC will do that. 
Or what? What was that? I don't know if you're a craft carrier in the middle of the ocean. Yo. I think Joe, Joe Rogan suggested that as well. Yo, if we could get a helicarrier from Marvel Comics and make it happen. <laughs> yeah, and make it happen. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see it happen. And it's, 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 just, it's just floating through the sky and it's got the big UFC logo on the side of it. And it's con- it's got a big TV monitor that's constantly just like showing what's happening. So that I want it so bad. That can you imagine what the gate for something like that could be? It's ridiculous. You need to fly in the air thousands of feet above everybody and watch a UFC fight. It'd be wild. It would be so wild. That's what they have been waiting to break the news on. I bought this one carrier the other day. <laughs> Oh man! Apparently, this dude that used to run this multi-million-dollar weapons company died recently, saving the world. So they're all just selling them like like scrap metal. It's hotcakes out here, man. Oh, that'd be great. I love the expression hotcakes. You know, um, besides like places like Abu Dhabi, I've also heard rumors of it taking place in Florida for whatever reason. I haven't really, really. Yeah, I didn't really. I didn't really look into that too much, just because it sounded too Florida. too crazy. Um, I don't know if they meant like off the coast of Florida or what, but I heard Florida. I've also heard Russia is a possibility. I've heard Russia because I've also heard that I think uh, Khabib is over. He's doing a, he's doing a training camp in Russia. He just switched to a training camp in Russia. I think. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure somebody in the mountains in Afghanistan would host it. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I don't know. Because you fight in the streets. You said you want to fight in the streets. Yeah, and, and, and overall it makes sense because Dana White even brought up the possibility of the, that the card was most likely, with the new restrictions uh, the, the U.S. government has placed on you know, mass events, uh, Dana White even said that the card's probably not even going to take place in the U.S. You know, we can't do it. We can't work with the restrictions they gave us. We tried to work with... They were able to work with the 50 people in a room restrictions that they gave them for UFC Brasilia. And then it changed the following Monday. Then they couldn't do it anymore. And now it makes sense that they would have the fight over in Russia or Abu Dhabi. You know, it makes so much more sense to have it over in those places versus here... Um, again, you know, the only real concerns I have is how is this going to affect Tony Ferguson? It would be, it's easy for Nurmagomedov and it's easy for Dana White to hop on a plane and, and cross over, but is it going to be that easy for Tony Ferguson? Because not necessarily saying that Tony Ferguson wouldn't want to fight, but how many situations have you come across, you know, as a fan uh, and seeing that somebody would, ref- re- you know, refuses to go fight somewhere just because of the of the distance, or just because suddenly now they were gonna fight someplace, now they gotta go all the way over somewhere else and fight. You know, it's not as crazy as, say, bringing up John Jones again. That time he couldn't get. Well, as long as you bring up the guy, just forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that time he couldn't get licensed in Nevada and they had to move the card from Las Vegas to like San Francisco or whatever in like a day and that's a little, that's a little different and that's a little bit more understandable why fighters could you know go to that because you know that's that's a plane trip that's that's a few hours if you're talking about going from where they were originally stationed in the Barclays Center in Brooklyn all the way around the other side of the world, that's a little bit different. That is a little bit more understandable why you would be frustrated about having to go over there, not to mention the travel restrictions that are being placed on, you know, airlines and international travel as a whole. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a sticky situation, and it kind of makes me a little nervous um, how, how it all is going to eventually unfold, because it's one thing for me to sit here and say, oh, I'm a little worried about Tony Ferguson. Well, there are, you know, at least a dozen other guys that are going to be on this card. 
and I don't know how it's going to affect them. Because keep in mind, you, uh, Dana White is out here saying, not only am I going to have UFC 249 on April 18th in an undisclosed location that I've already come up with, but he's still in the process of building the card, is from is from what I'm understanding, is from the different interviews I'm, I'm hearing. He is still in the process of building this card. We're already under a month out. He doesn't have the card made up yet. And that originally caused concern for me because I was like, okay, great. This is another thing that says we're probably not going to get this card or we're probably not going to get this specific fight. You know, the card hasn't even been finished yet. But then uh, I kind of got reassured a little bit when I found out that Dana White was trying to reschedule um, other events that had to be postponed, you know, like uh, Ngannou versus Rosenstrike, for example. Something, something I was going to talk about uh, after this uh, is trying to be rescheduled for uh, April 18th. The, I've heard that Dana White is trying to... I've heard from Dana White and I've heard from Francis Ngannou that uh, the UFC is in the is working right now to get the Ngannou Rosenstrike um, match uh, rescheduled to fit and coincide with the UFC 249 card. Where exactly... What? What a crazy event that would be if they did cancel the next three fights, or like how they canceled the next three cards. Yeah. And then just put them all onto that one. Just took all the main events and put them all in one card. I think that would be crazy. Oh my god, that'd be crazy. Now, we haven't heard anything from Tyron Woodley and Leon Edwards. Now, from what I understand, because Tyler Woodley seems, just based on his personal persona, he puts it out there, he seems like he'd be a little bit more complicated to get him to go places. Uh, and Leon Edwards, as we know right now, um, Great Britain has... Uh, Great Britain. Uh, the U- yeah, the UK has basically shut down, pretty much, in its entirety. Um, so, so that is something that wasn't brought up, and I think that's why, is just because... That's that's hard, you know. That's hard to even really get out and make that work as soon as possible. Um, so, but I do know that Dana White is still looking to reschedule that specific event. When and where in the future, I don't know. Um, I don't know what he. All I've really heard right now is he is thinking about fitting the Ngannou Rosenstrike fight onto this card, and I've actually also heard he's trying to fit. Um, Henry Cejudo versus Jose Aldo from U- that was supposed to be saved for UFC 250 I think is now also trying to be scheduled for this uh, event as well. What was the fight? Uh, Henry Cejudo versus Jose Aldo for the Bantamweight. Oh, that's a good one right there too. Yeah, so basically um, we're looking at we're looking at if, if this does go the way you know, he's saying it's going to go, or the way he's hoping it's going to go, we'll find out which one, is you've got Rosenstrike and Ngannou, um, likely, you know, before, um, I mean, this this could be a potential card with, like, three title fights, Francis Ngannou and Rosenstrike, Cejudo and Aldo, Nami Yunez and Andrade, I believe. I want that rematch! And then... No head spiking this time. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, and that was such a good fight. That was a great fight. Um, and then... Main event, main event. Oh, yeah. Ferguson and Nurmagomedov. So, that's a pretty stacked card right there, if I do say so myself. And that is also not including uh, some of the other fights that have been saved... Uh, for that card in particular, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll pull it up right here for you guys, just because I didn't have it pulled up and I didn't think I would get this far. Um, yeah, not to mention you still have Alexander uh, Hernandez, Jeremy Stevens, and Calvin Qatar are going to be going at it. Oh yeah, and we talked about this on last week's podcast too. That uh, that rematch for those guys, Ion or Eon uh, Kutalaba. And uh, the other guy, forget his name. I, I can just look it up right here. Oh snap! No, no, we have the internet. Oh, You're now. Oh, shizzle. It was. It was. 
Was it on this card? Man, it was a while ago. Yes, it was. Magomed Ankalaev. That's who I was thinking of. So yeah, so that rematch is also supposed to be scheduled for UFC 249. So, looking at a pretty uh, stacked fight here. And, uh, then, yeah, and then I've also heard, you know, Anthony Smith, who was supposed to be fighting at UFC Fight Night 173 the following uh, 25th of April, who's supposed to be fighting Glover um, Tejira. Um, he's also, Anthony Smith has come out recently saying that he is not sure whether or not that's actually going to happen. So that's uh, that's another thing that's a little cause for concern. Really, really, I just want to kind of emphasize how hectic and uh, and just how crazy this whole shtick is going to be. You know, like how crazy this card is going to eventually be if it eventually does manage to come to fruition. So that's crazy. Um, yeah, um, and really, kind of branching from this. I wanted to go ahead and start talking about um, the uh, one of my favorite matchups coming off of that card is really just um, the Francis Ngannou Rosenstrike card. I don't know why in particular that one really caught my eye, but that's one I really hope um, actually gets rescheduled. And the reason I say hopefully is and that I don't know if it's for sure going through. They say they're working. UFC says they're working on it, and Ganu says he got a call that they're working on it. But the problem is that, from what I hear from Rosenstrike's coach, um, he has not gotten a call for it yet. So that's something to uh, be looking forward to. Yeah. So that's gonna be good. Um, if that does, if that does end up happening, I really hope it does. Um, you know what's interesting? I actually heard somebody say earlier today. I was looking through like some comments about the the whole thing, and I had actually heard somebody say that uh, Ngannou is really underrated, and that Rosenstrike is extremely overrated. What do you think about that? I kind of agree. Do you agree as a whole? I don't know to what extent that they're trying to say that he is. Right. But. Like, I remember I had, like, I had been watching for a while, and I didn't know who Ngannou was for a long time until, like, the Stipe fight. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And then I was watching, like, his catalog, and I was like, no, I remember these fights, I just don't remember him. Weird. Because, like, I remember... Like the certain knockouts and stuff, and I remember when he fought Cain Velasquez recently, and I remember when he fought Stipe, and I remember when he knocked the fuck out of Alistair Overeem. Yeah. When he when he completely what? took off Overeem's head? Yeah, when he kind of gave him that uppercut hook combination thing, because Alistair was doing a weird duck and weave type move, and then he just got caught. Yeah. Like, but those are way more impressive, like, all of his wins are way more impressive than. Like, the fight, if you can compare just the Alistair Overeem fights between both of them. Like, Alistair dominated uh, Rosenstrike for pretty much all five rounds until he just got caught. Yeah, when he just got when cracked. They fought, when Francis fought Alistair, it was like ten seconds and then it was over. It was like, it was like a complete show of dominance uh, over Overeem from Nganu's perspective and then when it came to Overeem versus Rosenstrike it was kind of more like Overeem yeah like it almost kind of put off this impression that Rosenstrike just got you know kind of a lucky uh, shot in there but uh, if, if if we're you know playing devil's advocate here that is the name of the game when it comes to um, the heavyweight division is really just it doesn't matter you know you, it, it, really you can say that about any fight but it doesn't you don't win until you win you know, and Overeem kind of in that fight was winning on the scorecards, but like every good heavyweight, when they're really tired and when they really need it, when they need to pull that last little bit out of them right at the tail end there, Rosenstrike's got that. You know, he was able to pull it out right when it counted, 
and he knocked the fuck out of Overeem. You know, he completely split that dude's face open. Um, the one of the worst cuts I've ever seen. Yeah, literally. That was terrifying. And then you got to think about, you know, the kind of competition uh, that, you know, uh, Rosenstrike has also fought so far. I mean, he, if he's if he's beaten the likes of Alistair Overeem, then he's beaten the likes of uh, Andre Arlovsky. Not to mention, he also has the second fastest knockout in UFC history under his belt. So, something to, something to take into consideration here when you, when you think about the guy. Um... Because I don't want to say that. I guess if I had to, if I had to say, if I had to pick, obviously, Francis Ngannou seems like the more complete fighter. When I, when I look at Rosenstrike, I definitely see a fighter who has so much potential. He literally has so much power. He's got so much drive. And as we saw in the Overeem fight, he has heart. You know, he had the ability to stick it in, stick it out in that fight, and mess that dude up. Um, yeah. Even See, the thing is, I think that Ngannou is already at that point, yes. and the Rosen strike is still has potential, has to get there. Is yeah. the difference between them? Yeah, and I think that's going to end up being a a really cool match uh, because. You know, there are tons of guys uh, in the heavyweight division right now that kind of remind me a lot of... That Rosenstrike reminds me a lot of, I should say. You know, Derek Lewis is the first person that comes to mind. Um, I'm still waiting on Derek lewis Rosenstrike fight. I think that would actually be a lot closer of a fight um, than what I predict the Nganu rosenstrike fight would be. I feel like when it comes to um, Nganu versus Rosenstrike, it's going to be one of those matches where... Ngannou will potentially be leading on the scorecards, and he'll potentially have control over most of the fight. But he'll, but he will, but he will have to be, you know, watchful of Rosenstrike because he's not a prospect for no reason. You know, he is out here knocking dudes out. He's finished nine of his ten undefeated streak. You know, so. Is a, is a, it's a legitimate threat is really I guess what I'm in a, is what I'm hitting at here um, and uh, you know if, if, if Rosenstrike gets at least a few more good fights under his belt we could be, we could potentially be looking at you know a new title contender in the near future I could definitely see it but it's one of those things where we have to see how good he does in this fight yes I, I was, to, re- to really gauge because Alistair is a is a he's like is it, like sometimes he fights really well and sometimes he doesn't so like it depends like he's like the gatekeeper for the heavyweight division pretty much because he used to be great but you know he's just been through it he's got like fifty something fights yeah he's and and we talked about this last week too I think where I I, I had stated that he's got kind of a weak chin you know. Especially now, after all these years. So, that's why whenever you put Rosenstrike up against a big name like Ngannou, then we'll really see what, what where the hype lies. Yeah, it makes sense, because really up to this point, I think he's only fought like a handful of times in the UFC, Rosenstrike. Um, I think like four now. Yeah, so I think the first time it was up against somebody who I don't think should have been in the octagon. Um, really, that guy that was on the contender series that you researched? No, that was a uh, that was his second opponent in the UFC. Um, the first guy was actually some guy who was a lot taller than him. I don't remember his name, um, but that was like one of those instances where like that was where you could really see. Um, the 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 amount of power Rosenstrike had in his punches, without actually knocking the other guy you know unconscious in the first place. The second guy he fought, which I almost you know now that now that we're full fledged MMA channel, I almost want to do an entire video on him. But it, it it's one of those things where it seems almost irrelevant at this point. But uh, Alan Alan Crowder has such an amazing story. I don't know why his story just like 
you know, really get it really speaks to me. I don't know why. It's it's a story that really speaks to me and I and I for the life of me will never understand why I myself love it love his his tale so much. But he got he got he got knocked out in nine seconds, man, you know? Like Rosenstrike, that's what that's that's who he holds that record over. And that sucks because Alan Crowder will always be known as the guy who holds the record in the UFC for second fastest knockout. He's no Ben Askren, but he's right there next to him. Um, but Rosa yeah, says... Yeah, it's that Ben Askren has collegiate medals and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, no, but that's the difference. Nobody knows dick about Alan Crowder. Nobody knows absolute dick about this guy. And it's crazy. Um, but, but, I mean, like, not, that's, not to, that's not to say that the other guy wasn't decorated and the other guy didn't have some level of... Um, competition to him that made him a competent athlete. Um, but the thing is, is that when you look at those first two opponents that Rosenstrike went up against, they were they were the small time guys. They were the guys that were in the same position as Rosenstrike was, and they were trying to make you know get some traction, you know create some footing in the industry. And then Rosenstrike kind of ascended past that level. You know, after those first two fights, he ascends past that level, and then he he fought Andre Arlovsky and Alistair Overeem, who, in this new stage of his career, were two of the guys that at one point in their careers were the top ten guys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, Andre was the heavyweight champion for a minute. Yeah. Alistair Overeem was Alistair like was in, was in top for, a few, for a while. Yeah, he was a pride. He was a championship. He was a champion in pride. You know, he he, he, had, he, he had a lot of accomplishments to his own name. Um, but then you know they kind of became the guys that just weren't great anymore. You know, they're not awful, but they're just not up to snuff with this new level of competition. And Rosenstrike, I think, is part of that new wave of uh, competition. And now, this fight with Francis Ngannou is really that test, like you said, if he if he can really go toe-to-toe with that level of competition. Because Francis Ngannou... Exactly. Like he's he's top tier. He's top five. He's top three, man. You're looking at you're looking at someone who has fought for the title and who came pretty close in those first few rounds against Stipe. Like, this is no joke. And so now it it it's gonna be one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, it's one of those things where it makes me wonder, was this a little premature? You know, I kind of get worried when it comes to stuff like that. But you look at the rankings and you look at some of the people that he's already fought. Um, do I believe that maybe it was a little too soon to get him to fight Francis Ngannou? Maybe. Like I said, I wouldn't have mind uh, about with Derek Lewis. You know I'm always down for the Derek Lewis. Um, then there's also Junior Dos Santos. There's Curtis Blades. Um, really, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, it kind of feels like a... A Darren Till situation. Another person we'll, we'll be getting to uh, later here, but uh, where it seems like he was kind of ele- he's he's being he's being elevated to levels of competition. Um, he may or may not be ready for just yet, but if he if he is, we will hopefully see it on April eighteenth. Just gotta write that down. Okay, so that being said. That's kind of where I'm at uh, when it comes to that. I don't want to make any predictions. I don't want to get too crazy with it. Uh, I already said. Let's see what happens. Do what? I just want to see what happens when you lock them both. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I really, I, we've already said that we kind of have the edge in Francis and Ganu's favor. So I'm just gonna go ahead and bump those from the uh, tab bar. Uh, and uh, one of the things I had uh, mentioned earlier was a. Uh, you know, depend. You know, great, huge future details, and that's really all we can do now at this point with so much inactivity in the sport right now. Um, but speaking on uh, behalf of the future, uh, I mentioned a possible uh, Daniel Cormier and Stipe uh, rematch that could potentially lead to, you know, whoever wants to be the future heavyweight uh, champion down the line. You know, whenever 
that becomes the case. Um, and, and I bring that up because um, I've got it pulled up here. Daniel Cormier has been uh, talking to... He's been talking with the UFC, and he has been uh, talking about how they're trying to get the uh, trilogy fight between him and Stipe set up. Yeah, so that's going to be something to be looking forward to. I wanted to bring that up just because uh, that's something to that's something to be excited about, you know. And, and really, it uh, is something to be excited about just based on how Daniel Cormier feels about it. Because I haven't really found anything uh, to give me indication on how Stipe feels about it. Uh, all I've heard is what uh, Daniel Cormier has to say about it. I don't know what that necessarily says about Stipe and where he's at on the whole matter, since he's not being very vocal about it. Or he he might I don't think he's much of a social media guy, so he probably just hasn't really taken to anybody yet. He's probably just you know quarantined right now and he's not doing any interviews. But basically, um, based on what DC says, is that he believes that Stipe has expressed interest and that really for both men it's kind of what they need because they're one in one right now yeah after that exposure he really is the best yeah because they were one in one in two fights that had pretty definitive finishes you know it, it wasn't like it wasn't like Daniel Cormier completely blew Stipe out of the water the first time and then Stipe you know, just barely scraped by with a unanimous decision, you know, it was. Yeah, they both knocked each other out. Yeah, so, and, and Daniel Cormier has been extremely vocal uh, since the fact that he wants that rematch, that he believes he is is uh, deserving of said rematch. And in a way, I agree with what he's saying, uh, but he's almost kind of in the position where he feels like he should get the rematch next, and that's it. You know, nobody else should be fighting Stipe right now, making Daniel Cormier wait any longer. Um, it's kind of interesting. What do you think about that? Do you believe that Daniel Cormier should immediately get this rematch? Or do you believe that other people are due uh, something? Because I understand where Daniel Cormier is coming from. Daniel wants this fight uh, so that he can say definitively, I am the greatest heavyweight of all time. So, I can see what, I can see it from pretty much both sides, like a little bit half and half, because DC's like, at the point where, win or lose the next fight, he's probably going to retire. Yes. So, it makes sense that he's trying to do that as quickly as possible, so that he's not waiting like a whole other year or two years for Stipe to recover, or for all the fights to go down, and everybody to go to their training camps and start to all come together finally. So it makes sense that he wants to do it first. Mm -hmm. He's also why they should do it first. But at the same time, you know, in God, you got in God who wants a rematch with Stipe. Yes. You got you got Derek Lewis who wants another title shot after he was had a five round war with DC. Yep. So you just got a lot of other people that are waiting, and is it really fair to keep them waiting for this long when they're active and young and whatnot? Exactly. No, it's just one of those where I'm 50-50 on it. Like, I think that DC should get a, another rematch because he gave Stipe one. That's like, and one Stipe was ready. Yep. But it's just one of those things. Yeah, he, uh... Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting. I kind of see... It kind of paints a different picture when DC says, that's the fight I want to retire on. And it's like, whoa, okay. Because now it kind of adds like a whole new level of importance to the fight. Because um, DC wants the fight to happen like this year. And he wants it as soon as possible. As soon as all this quarantine shit gets done and dealt with. And you know, his, his uh, you know, if UFC 249 comes and goes and it was a clean, smooth transition. You know, he wants to be able to have whatever comes next be his rematch and he feels like he he's, he's deserved it because he he this whole he's I think what it is right now especially is that he's a little scared of the quarantine uh, fiasco basically making it to where 
fighters are so inactive and fighters can't do anything. He, he, I think what he is, he's afraid of retiring during this point in time in history where he'll basically, he'll, he'll, be, he'll go, he'll retire, and he'll be gone without really much fuss brought up over it. Like, I believe he was comparing himself to a uh, NBA player who had something very similar happen to him. Uh, it says right here on the screen, Vince Carter from the NBA um, had a lackluster fe- farewell after the NBA suspended its season due to the uh, spread of COVID-19. And the season, I'm assuming, was meant to be uh, Carter's last season. And it was meant to be his send-off season, but because you know it got canceled and he couldn't do anything with it, uh, what I assume is a veteran of, of basketball has been forced to retire without so much as a, a, a birthday party, you know, without so much as a, a, a goodbye party, you know. And, and, and I can understand that DC doesn't want that same thing to happen because how many fighters do you and I know of that had some pretty lackluster retirements that didn't have the kind of send-offs that they deserved, you know. Big names come to mind like Matt Hughes is the first one. You know, Matt Hughes had a really lackluster send-off when it was just announced one day that he was retired from fighting and he was going to be working for the UFC. And so I get that. And, and with that information in mind, it kind of makes me think, well, you know what? All you other guys, you can go fuck yourself, I guess. Is, is You know? Because, I mean, like, now it's not, yeah, it's these young guys, yeah, they want their shot at the title, but it's like, okay, we're looking at one of the greats of the sport right now. We're looking at Daniel Cormier, collegiate wrestler, decorated Olympian, and you've got the fact that he is, he's like, he's like 22-2 and two in the UFC, only losing to, respectively, the two greatest in their own respective division, John Jones, Stipe, respectively. And he's finished like 15 out of those 22 fights, you know, either by knockout or submission. You're looking at a very dangerous man. I, I'll pull it up for you right here. The stats. Very dangerous man. 10, 10 TKO KOs, 5 submissions. Wild. I think he's better than John Jones. I'm just going to say it. Well, there you go. I don't think he's ever gotten the respect he deserves, and nobody's ever given it to him, right? Yeah, and then it's it's gonna suck when if you know this does send him off and he has to leave out, because because I mean, bro, he was one of the original champ champs. He was the second one. Exactly, and he and he as of this moment in time holds the record for the only champ champ to have defended both belts. And that's crazy. That's crazy to me. Because that goes into the whole... And meanwhile, Amanda Nunes is doing it every other week now. Well, Amanda Nunes, I know, actually does have her first um, title um, defense in the featherweight belt uh, going up against... um, Here it is. Oh, well, they don't have the rankings for the featherweight. Still, still they don't have rankings for the featherweight belt. But I believe it was Jessica something or another. But that's going to be her first. Do what? Is it Jessica I? No, Jessica I is going to be fighting uh, Valentina Shevchenko uh, for the flyweight. Let me see if it pulls it up here in the future. UFC 250. Yeah, it was scheduled for UFC 250. Um, And it was going to be against... Oh, never mind. It wasn't Jessica. It was Felicia Spencer. That's what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that now. I don't know why I said Jessica. Just because you're a liar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why I do you this to myself. Yeah. But, yeah, so, so Amanda Nunes will be, not only will she be the first women's double champ in the UFC, she'll also be the first women's double champ in the UFC to have defended both belts. Whether or not she'll actually defend the featherweight belt, you know, come May, we don't know. That, I mean, like I, I'm going. I'm just going to go ahead and say nobody can beat Amanda Nunes right now. She's on such a hot streak. Uh, Felicia Spencer, she's not going to make it. But, 
but but I don't want to jump to conclusions. You know, that's for that's for that's a whole other topic for another show. We're talking about DC and Stipe right now, so that's uh, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I don't I know I just said I don't want to do predictions for Ngannou versus Rosenstrike, but bro, I've got to ask. These guys are one and one. Who do you think is going to win in the rematch? Stipe. Stipe. Now, <laughs> why is that, might I ask? He's just younger, and so there's a theory, right? I mean, he's only 38, let's be fair. I thought he was 40 now. If I'm not mistaken, I could be. I thought it was 38. Thirty-seven. Oh. Mm-hmm. He'll be thirty this August. Really? I yeah. thought he was older than that. Well, he's still older for a UFC standard. True. True. Um, and so there's a theory that I listened to, and I didn't believe it too much, but I think it could have played a factor. Uh huh. Is so DC and Stipe fought the first time they fought. Stipe just came off of fighting and gone him. Like how how recent? It was probably a, like a five or so months after. Oh wow! So I think that it's possible that his chin could have sustained injuries, and that is what led DC to become the victor. But I'm not taking anything away from DC. He hit him clean as shit. Yeah, <laughs> he completely pressed his face into the mat. Yeah, and then he stood over him and hit him a few more times. Yeah. <laughs> that was a few years ago now. That was and last year. Like, like, if DC can win early, then it's DC's fight. Like, if he just out-wrestles him immediately, because it's, like, the last fight, it was, like, pretty much a kickboxing match with, like, one or two takedowns in there. Right. Which isn't the way that DC should be fighting at this point in his career where he's just going to take injury for four rounds. Yeah. I mean, he should be in complete control wrestling him. I mean, if, you, if, if you're going to go out, go out with a bang, you know? That's true, go out with a bang, but if the last fight you were planning on retiring, don't go that hard. True, true. Like, don't put yourself in the position to get hurt like you did. Well, now that he is planning on retiring after this no, fight... No, he's planning on retiring after this fight. If you guys are not, go out with a bang and get knocked out again. I don't care what you say. <laughs> Do whatever you want. Like, if you're trying to win, try to win. Yep. You're, like, giving him too many chances. Yep. Makes sense. But I just think Stipe... I think... The same kind of thing is going to happen where they fight and it's really, really even until it gets towards the end, and then Steve Bay just turns it up on him. Yeah, that could be a that could be a possible uh, factor. I mean, I you know we'll see what happens. You know, you're looking at two of the best in the world. Right Steve now. Bay's got better card handle against you know the daddest man on the planet, DC. Yep. The daddest man. The daddest man. You'll the DMF. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah, so that's kind of where that's at. I don't really have any predictions. I'm not. Uh, I don't know. Did you see the Did, did you see the video of Stephen Thompson reacting to the Anthony Pettis Superman punch knockout? Bro, I'm so glad you brought that up. Let me write, let me write something down real quick. Okay, one thirteen. Okay, so. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. This is great. So, so basically, um, yes, I did. And I had actually pulled it up on my tabs. It was going to be one of the things we were going to talk about today. Awesome. Got it pulled up right here, fresh on the screen. Dude, this was so funny. This was so cool. Why is Stephen Thompson being such a man? Yeah, why does he have the best ass in USC? And why does he have to be such a... He's, he's the nicest mofo. That's why they're giving him that belt. Dude, he is literally... He is literally one of the nicest guys in the world. How does this man exist and he just knocks people out? I don't know. Have you ever watched some of his old kickboxing videos? Uh, I might have seen one. 
but I have not seen enough to really form an opinion on. So he's like 50 and 0 or something in kickboxing. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, like, I'm, pretty sure, like, I'm pretty sure he never lost a kickboxing fight. Jeez. So I've seen a few of them because, you know, it wasn't a big thing like 10 years ago, whatever he was, especially in America. Yeah. So they, they like, fight in this padded bowl, like, structure, right? Yep. And if you hear his dad just going, like, just telling him what to do, and then he goes, like, front kick, and he just front kicks the guy in the face, like a side roundhouse kind of thing from the front leg, and just hits him right on the jaw, and the guy goes to sleep with his arms up in the air. And you hear his dad just go, yep, that's what you're supposed to do, and just no excitement in his voice. Oh yeah. I was just like, and that's the dude who's the nicest guy ever who has like the military ass training. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I just replayed the uh, knockout for everybody. I'm trying not to show like a lot of it. I'm trying to like alter the speed for it so we don't get copyright claimed. But at this point. It really doesn't matter. It's it's pretty great. I want you guys to be able to see it, but I guess what it would be better for me to do is just tell you guys to go watch it. I'm just kind of going over the actual uh, knockout and setups itself. It's a, it's a pretty it's pretty funny. Really, you know, obviously you can go watch the fight. Whatever the fight's not really the main drawing point here. It's really just kind of so cool that a UFC fighter really would take the time to live stream. <laughs> his reactions to his old fights like this, especially to him getting brutally KO'd like he did against Anthony Pettis. It's such a, and it's such an authentic, he, I think that's what I like so much about Stephen Thompson, I think that's why he's beginning to blow up more and more as, as the days go by, is that he's just a very authentic person, you know? He's the nicest mofo. Yeah, and he really just, he really just is... He just literally actually lives and breathes that life. He's just the opposite of John Jones. Yeah. Because it is. Just bring it back to the start of the video. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that's basically, I don't know. Uh, I just replayed it again in super duper slow motion on top of his super duper slow motion. So, hopefully, you guys can get a really good uh, image of that. <laughs> um, but, seriously. Do you, do you know what had, like, a Mandela effect type thing happen? What's that? I mean, I know what Mandela effect, but what was it? So, in my memory, I distinctly remember Anthony Pettis jumping off the cage. Yes. But actually doesn't touch the cage when he does the... No, no, he does. <laughs> no, he touched with his back. Well, yeah, yeah. Off it. But I remember him kicking off of it, but he doesn't actually touch the cage with his foot when he, kicks, when he, when he does the Superman punch setup. Yeah, it's more like his foot just kind of like plants right in front of the cage. Yeah, so, but in, like, I, I watched it, on, like, I bought the pay-per-view and everything for that one, and for some reason in my memory is he doesn't, like, in my memory he didn't even, like, you know how he, like, kind of backs into it and bounces off a little bit before to get the momentum? Yeah. In my mind, he just jumped up, used his foot, kicked it, and then hit him. Like, he, he uh, kicked him off the face with his foot. And then, like, watching it in slow motion and stuff, I was like, that's really weird, because that's not how I remember that happening. Right. It's almost like he used the momentum of him walking backwards off of uh, Stephen Thompson's sidekick. Yeah. And he then, used that momentum of getting pushed back, and then he immediately jumped forward with it. Yeah, he immediately bounces off. And and, and Stephen will tell you, you know, it's a short video, guys. Check it out. It's on the UFC's YouTube channel, but Stephen basically says that he was literally, like, walk, as it was happening, he remembers it happening, like, in, in slow motion in real life for him. You know, it was that he, he went off of the sidekick to the ribs, to the midsection, and it kind of grazed off of... Anthony Pettis, and when Steven's foot landed, it basically left him in a position where he was really squared up, and he was, tr as he was trying to yeah, he tried to reposition himself immediately, Anthony Pettis is firing off with that Superman punch, and Thompson is trying to check it with a uh, counter of, of his own and, uh just didn't happen. He was, Pettis was just too fast. So yeah, that's basically that. 
go check that out. I don't want to. I'd love to talk about it more, but I don't want to talk about it anymore because I'm afraid of getting claimed. Um, we, we probably already are, but whatever. Check that out. Uh, it's okay. This is just a passion project at this point. Pretty much, I, and I'm okay with that. So check that out if you guys get a second. And yeah, so boom. Oh, boop! I accidentally clicked on something. Don't want that. Okay. <laughs> All right, all right. So, so that was that, uh, and this is just getting into some of the smaller stuff that we've been uh, uncovering here. Uh, speaking of um, smaller stuff, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna look at uh, that thing I told you about right before we started recording. Was the uh, Darren Till yet again calling out Israel Adesanya in I'm his? I'm tired of this little toss boy. You are. Yeah, are you? No, okay, can I tell you why I'm getting a little tired of Darren Till right now? Why? Because Darren Till, I mean, first of all, it's really hard nowadays to differentiate between Darren Till and the real Darren Till. And the, oh, the, the fake singer versus the real person? Yeah, because, and, and, it, and then it kind of becomes hard to tell if the entertainer is the real person. Or if the real person is just completely in contrast to the entertainer. It's, it's, it's really confusing, it's really fickle, and I don't really understand how to feel about it because he was a certain way, you know, going into his, coming off of his losses of, his two consecutive losses, from Tyron Woodley to Jorge Masvidal, he came off some pretty rough losses there, and he kept a pretty decent attitude about it. And he bumped up to middleweight, and he had his fight with Kevin Gastelum, after the fight had happened, well, one, we something we already knew something was off going into the fight. The fight was just weird. It wasn't the way we've normally seen Darren Till before. And then, especially in the post-fight... Yeah, and especially in the post-fight presser, uh, in his interviews, he was, a, he was very, very different from how we had seen him uh, originally. It was a very huge character shift. Uh, he, was, he was talking about how he was extremely scared you know, to go into the fight tonight, and that he even considered uh, faking an injury just to get out of fighting. Um, and it was really off-putting. It was really weird. And then it got to a point where... Um, it got to a point where he just kind of started uh, doing these weird, like, sort of troll kind of things on Twitter, and he started, you know, kind of trying to parody, I guess, the persona he had put out there after his fight with Kevin Gastelum, and he talked about how, you know, some people, I think, I think it was one of those things where some people were like, oh, Darren Till talks this mad shit, but he wouldn't actually fight somebody like Yoel Romero, and then Darren Till tried to actually turn it into, like, a joke, try to turn it around on people, but in some cases, was kind of blurring the line on how serious he was, because he was like, yeah, I don't want to fight Yoel Romero. I would literally fight anybody else but Yoel Romero, because Romero is scary. And now it, it seems like going into this current um, attempt at uh, irritating the uh, champion Adesanya, Darren Till has basically made it seem like... It's almost like now that Adesanya has beaten Yoel Romero, and Romero had that god-awful performance at UFC 245, or no, 248, um, now it seems like Darren Till has like this new swell of confidence that he can actually beat Adesanya. Um, and I don't know, but I'll just, you know, if you guys see um, the uh, Twitter post, I'm playing it right now, it's only like eight seconds long, so you guys aren't, aren't going to have any audio, but it's basically just Darren Till just being... Honestly, like, pretty funny. <laughs> like, he's, it's, it's pretty goofy how he goes about calling him out. I don't know if you've seen it uh, or not. I haven't. It's, uh, it's just it's a little tiny eight-second thing that he DM'd Adesanya, and then Adesanya took it and uh, posted it on his Twitter. He posted it on his Twitter, basically. He said, D it, it's, it's so funny. Yeah. And, uh... It's basically, basically the the video is just Darren Till saying, I'm coming for you, you know, like, I'm coming for you, like, in the future. And it's one of those things where it's like, is he joking? Is he trolling? I don't know. 
the weird fucking in the internet and in the world of UFC where you're just like, is this a legitimate call out? Yeah. Is this real? Is this something mean something somebody else? Because you're yeah. not getting somebody else. Yeah, because yeah, he had he had beaten Kevin Gastelum. Um but then can we be can, I was about to say, can we just be honest here? Mm, that was kind of a that was, a bad job, huh? that was like a draw, but it was also obvious that Kevin Ga- Kevin Gaston just didn't show up for that fight. That neither one of those men really showed up for that fight. And uh, yeah, it was kind of like wow, you know. So cool. Darren Till immediately gets bumped right into the fifth spot after having only beaten like one guy who was. Um, a title contender, you know? And then they're not gonna have... I mean, like, shit, you know? I mean, like, they've got him fighting Robert Whitaker uh, in July, or August, uh, I believe, which is crazy. Um, Not necessarily crazy that he's fighting the number one contender, because, I mean, you know, Izzy was too busy, quote-unquote, fighting Yoel Romero, Paulo Costa is waiting for his fight with Izzy. Now Darren Till is going to be fighting Whitaker. It's just—it's just interesting. It's just interesting to say the least. I'm really—I'm—I'm re- I'm honestly, despite the trolling and despite um, whatever series. See, okay, real quick, breaking away from that train of thought, jumping back onto the previous one. This is where I'm kind of confused on how serious. Um, Darren Till is because he trolls Adesanya but then you know people will you know tweet out hey Darren Till right here I have it on screen I love you man but don't Izzy KOs you every time you know and then Darren Till actually tweets back he replies and he says I love you too but he fucking won't not a single chance in hell healthy till a middleweight with wait Healthy Till at middleweight with his new improved mindset to training and all other things, not a fucking chance. And then that calls into question, well, is Darren Till, is this just part of some new mindset that Darren Till is like psyching himself up for, you know? Is Darren Till putting himself in a position where he's like, okay, I'm, I'm genuinely going to go in here, I'm going to fuck this guy up. And all this trolling and stuff, that's part of the confidence that he has to perpetuate to really convince himself that he can do it. And at that point, it's like, okay, you know, geez, I, I don't even know what to think. You know, like, what do you, what do you, what do you do with information like that? I, I have no idea. It's a, it's a very weird circumstance that this is going on at this time. Yeah. i tell you what. It's like, if it, if it happened not around this quarantine time, then it might have been like a completely different conversation where they're just like, yeah, let's go right now. Yeah. <laughs> just watch that video again. It's so stupid. It's so funny. I don't know how to explain it. Um, but anyway, yeah. It's like, it's, it's like, I tell you what, Darren Till. I tell you what, buddy. You do me a favor, and I'll do you a favor. You you beat Robert Whitaker in August, and then we'll talk, and then we'll talk. Okay, then we'll talk about a uh, a UFC event. All right, we'll talk about a title shot, and then we'll see what you do. Because here's the thing: this is going to be like one of those things where it's like the curse of Darren Till's entire career, constantly being pushed into situations that he probably was not initially prepared for. Case in point. His title fight with Tyron Woodley. In a match where he seemed almost completely outclassed with that level of competition. He hadn't beaten enough guys beforehand to necessarily earn a title shot. And that sucks. You know, that's just what happened. And now it's like, okay, he's beaten Kevin Ga- Gaslam. Okay, yeah, that was that's a big name in that division. But... To be fair, the kind of people that are just running shop on that division right now are like an entire league above where Kevin Kelvin Gastelum is. And Kelvin, and again, that fight where he beat Kevin quote unquote beat Kevin Gastelum was a very lackluster fight and didn't really sh- and, and like I said, neither one of those fighters showed up for that fight. 
And so it's going to become one of these things where it's like, okay, beat Robert Whitaker. If you can beat the former champion, then maybe you will be in the position for a title shot against Israel Adesanya. We'll see. We will see. And then, well, you know what? Maybe beat Robert Whitaker, and maybe we'll get you that fight with uh, with your boy, uh, Romero, we've been talking about so much. You know? You, you never know. You never know. Um, maybe a Jared uh, Cannonier fight. He, he deserves some love. Don't he? He's number three. Cannonier? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, what the hell? Darren Till fights one guy in middleweight, and now he's uh, number five? No. That can't be right. It is. He's fought, he's fought Kelvin Gaston, and now he's in the top five. Fuck that. That's wild. He should at least be, like, seven. Go ahead. Give him, give him Whitaker. Give him Romero. If he survives either of those, then we'll give him a title shot just to seal the deal and get him out of here. Exactly. Just so we can shut him up about it. So he can pick what he's, what side he wants to be on. So, yeah. That's all I have to say about Darren Till's ass right now. Um, where's my pen? Oh, man. One other chance you got pulled up. Alright, so I basically got one last little thing I was going to just briefly go over. We've basically covered everything in a a descending order from, like, the biggest news all the way down to, like, the lower stuff that's maybe not even really relevant. And the last thing I have here is... Florida man KOs drunk outside nightclub. Can you guess who that Florida man is? Uh, no. It is our favorite, <laughs> our favorite, <laughs> our favorite guy to talk about that we don't. That I think since we've started the show, I don't know if we've necessarily talked about this particular show. We might have done it on like the two podcasts that were unofficial, but this is the first time I think we'll be talking about him on Ninth Corner of the Octagon. Do you, can you guess who that is? I just want you to guess. I don't think I can. I want you to say it just so I can freak out. I, I, I'm not sure exactly. It is our favorite welterweight, Mr. Platinum Mike Perry. <laughs> 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 Oh yeah, that apparently is so tight with Tyron Woodley, he can just say the N-word right in his face. The guy who I don't even think is... His nose smushed, Yeah. Oh yeah, the guy who... He's armbarred by Donald Cerrone to make sure that he has the all-time leader and wins, the all-time leader and finishes. Yep. Yep. So, uh, pretty goofy, uh, to say the least. It's not even, like, a big deal. But it's like, every time Mike Perry does something, I just have to talk about it. So is he the one that knocks somebody out? Yes, he is the person that knocks somebody out. I'm actually going to... I'm on his Instagram right now. I'm going to go ahead and show the video that's up. It is a vicious knockout. (laughs) Like, holy (laughs) shit. (laughs) Knock the fuck out of this guy. (laughs) Oh my god, dude. It is is out let me read to you. Okay, so basically, let me give you context on what had happened. He was basically just like out at a nightclub, and um, gosh, I don't even. He was just out at a nightclub, and some guy was just messing with him, I guess. And this guy was messing with him. I guess he didn't know that he was Mike Perry, which makes sense. Nobody knows who Mike Perry is unless he does something like this. Um, <laughs> And Mike Perry was just like, hey man, you mess with me, you're going to catch these hands. And it's so, Lincoln, I don't know if you have it pulled up in front of you right now, but I'm just going to describe I it. Know, I was about to, but I didn't want it to come over the phone. Dude, it is so, it's, it's literally like five seconds. It's so vicious. It's basically, um, Mike Perry and this guy are having a verbal altercation out in the parking lot of the nightclub. And then, um, I guess the dude who I believe the woman that is trying to get in between them is the stranger, is the other man's um, girlfriend. And she's trying to talk both of them out from having a fist fight. And it's one of these crazy things where um, the guy and uh, the guy comes up to um, 
Mike Perry, and he you clearly you can kind of see he's got his fists clenched, but then for like a split second, I'm not shitting you, a literal split second, the man turns his attention away from Mike Perry, looks at the girl right in her eyes, and then at that split second that he took to do that, in that one instance of his life, Mike Perry with the absolute wrath of God completely shit on this dude's fucking life. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my goodness. I don't know why that's so funny. I don't know why that is so fucking funny. I'm playing it at least another five fucking times. It just BAM! <laughs> I mean, dude, dude, that's not like a light tap. He didn't just light tap him. He, he literally just went... Bam! Dude, he, he, he literally... Yeah, the guy's face, the guy's chin touches the back of his shoulder. <laughs> and then he goes down, and he's... Dude, he... He slammed into that concrete. His head, the back of his head had to have hit the asphalt. And then he tries to get up. He has no idea where he is. He has absolutely no clue what dimension he's in. He just went to escape on the multiverse. He literally hopped on a magic carpet and flew to a whole new world. A brand new world! I mean, dude, it's it's savage. And then, and then it was one of those things where, like... Um, I'll read to you here in a second what Mike Perry had to say about it on Twitter. But basically, it was like one of these things where um, he knocked the guy out, and then he just went. And he told the police what happened, and then he didn't like get charged or anything. And it was like, and it's crazy to me because I look at the situation, and it almost makes me wonder. Like, I don't really blame Mike Perry because uh, he didn't really. I don't know if he started. I don't think he did. He says he didn't. Um, but basically, it's one of these really goofy things where it's like the guy, the stranger, came towards him with bald fists. And he came towards him like he was wanting to fight. He didn't have his hands raised. Granted, it wasn't like Leon Edwards and Masvidal backstage. The guy didn't have his hands raised. But he had his fists balled up, and he was very tense. You could see that in his movements. I just came at me. He had his hands up like he wanted to fight. And I just got with the three-piece in the combo with the soda. Yeah, man, there's no, there's no three-piece here. He straight up just gave him the value meal. <laughs> he just gave him the, 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 the one, you know, just bang. <laughs> I mean, like, and, it, and it's crazy because the guy, for whatever reason, I mean... I, the, you see this dude oh. who's got preset shoes and cauliflower ears? Especially, especially if he's had some drinks, because you don't know what he's gonna do to you. Like, here, here's the thing, and and the reason I'm defending Mike Perry in this instance is because he he's not the guy. Well, he threw the punch. At first glance, it seems like the guy he threw a punch at a guy that wasn't ready, you know, because the guy did divert his attention. He, he kind of did. He, which he technically kind of did, but at the same time, the guy was looking right at Mike. And then Mike, according to his account, had already begun throwing the punch in the split second the guy turned his head. Because it's not like one of those things where it's like, oh, like a full second goes by, or, or a few beats goes by, and then he throws the punch while he's talking to his girlfriend. The, girl, the guy's girlfriend is like talking at him the entire time they're about to get into the fight. And of course, the one instance the guy diverts his attention to his girlfriend to talk to her, tell her, like, shut up, or whatever, he gets floored. He gets absolutely floored. He wasn't ready for it. He just got bopped. And honestly, you know, I I'll say this for Mike Perry. Kudos to him that he didn't try to escalate things further. He didn't try to ground and pound the guy. He didn't try to finish him anymore. He put that cold after he's already unconscious. Right. He didn't, he didn't just beat up on a defenseless dude. He cracked him for being an asshole. The guy went down. And Mike Perry walked away. He walked away. He said, hey, yo, cops, tell me what's happening right now. This dude is messing with me. And, and also, I want to say, um, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Mike Perry says something about how... Okay, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read you this real quick. Um, 
according to Mike Perry's account, the guy had actually punched him first. Well, then, if that's true, then kudos to him for not just mooring him in the middle of the place without it. Because this is one of those things where it's like, there's so many like instances like this that I can think of, but like this is like a really good one that starts right off the bat where nobody dies, you know? Where it's like, and it's not like police police brutality or anything. It's like one of these instances where like, you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Like, there are so many times where like the context around a video that's shown, you know, that goes viral, is changed based on when the video starts. Because at, at this point, if you were just to look at the video that was started and recorded, it would seem like Mike Perry's up to his usual shit. He got into an altercation with some guy at a bar, and he punched him when the guy wasn't watching. Is how it looks. Yeah, it's the context of what's around it, and you're just like, good on you, Mike Perry. Yeah, you just, well, at first you're like, wow, that Mike Perry guy, such a dumbass, just punched some guy who wasn't even ready for it. But then you go and you look at what his what he says happened, Again, what he said, what his accounts were, um, I'm gonna, he says, the guy punched me first, um, and, and then, and then, he punched me, he, it was basically like, they punched, some guy punched him in the mouth, and then it was immediately after somebody, whoever the person that was recording the footage, saw that happen, and that's when they started recording. Which makes sense, which is usually what happens when a video starts, is they go, oh shit, this is about to go down, click. Yeah, and then really all you see is the go down part. You don't see what led up to it. And this is, I'm telling you right now, ladies and gentlemen, this right here is a go down. This is a go down part. Bam! Goddamn. And then, oh, I just can't get over it. The guy just has no clues. I'm going to read you real quick his uh, uh, Twitter, um, shoot. It's Instagram, not Twitter. It, it's a. Uh, I might have been saying Twitter this whole time, but it's Instagram. Uh, what his uh, caption for the video he posted of it was was he said I'm going. I was going to the beach. This guy he uh, actually punched me in the mouth. Uh, then that's when they started recording. I created space. He followed with his fists balled. As I stepped into position around the girl, he either flinched or got distracted from what his drunk ass was doing, which was harassing me. So basically, Mike Perry is saying this guy was verbally harassing him. He was approaching him in a um, violent manner, so to speak. And right in that instance, the guy, from Mike's perspective, either flinched or got distracted. Now, in the footage, it's very clear the guy gets distracted from the girl that's talking to them. Very obvious that that's what happened. Um, so he got distracted. He w and after so he was harassing him. He wouldn't stop. So I ended it. I threw the jab slash hook split seconds before he hook before he looked to the left, which you can see in the video. I could have continued to ground and pound him to death, but walked away and spoke to the police. For any of you acting like you've ever done anything for me, please believe you play with fire, you're gonna get burned. And this is just Mike Perry going into like his typical shit he talks about all the time. If you can mind your space and social distance yourself from my bubble, from my personal bubble, then anything can be resolved through conversation. Judge me all you want, you bunch of cry to get your way hypocrites. But I live an honest life, and I am the most truthful person I know. I share my life with all of you watching, so please believe if you feel like you want to butt into anything you were not involved in, then you, your mama, your daddy, your wife, husbands, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons, and grandmas and grandpas can get these pro fire hands too, since it's okay to hit me, but not okay when I hit back. Check yourselves. There's no way that's what he said. That's verbatim. Verbatim. <laughs> that's verbatim what he said. <laughs> honestly. Honestly, man. I don't think there's... Honestly, Mike Perry is the MVP of 2020. That's why I can't stop talking about Mike Perry, dude. Every time he does something, I just always gotta bring it up. Anytime he does anything, it's gold. It's not like you hear about the everyday... And it's just some boring bullshit. Every time you hear about him, it's something controversial, it's something hilarious, it's something crazy. Well, that's why. 
my theory for president in 2022. Because he's only ranked like 20 or something in, in the UFC yeah. rankings. Well, they, well, this is as much as he wins. He's a journeyman as of right now. Yeah. And then he smashed in his last two fights. Yeah. Dude, he got messed up by Greg O'Neill. Or was it, yeah. was it Greg O'Neill? Or am I thinking of somebody else? I'm pretty sure it's Greg O'Neill, but we could be having the names playing Jeff, wrong. It was the... Jeff Neal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. He's a great name. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's going to be crazy. Um, so yeah, I, honestly, I don't know what's a better story to end on, if I'm being honest. But... I, was, I thought we were going to end on the cute little Stephen Thompson watching himself get knocked out, but this is so much better. Yeah, this is, this is ten times better, honestly. Yeah, so... That's really all we've got uh, covering uh, for you guys today on Ninth Corner of the Octagon. I thought we wouldn't have as much to talk about, but are we in the hour and 40 minutes of slow by? This is the longest episode we've had so far. It is when nothing's happening. Yeah, it's because we've just been having to dig for stuff, you know? We got lucky with that John Jones, though, for sure, because that oh. happened, like, this morning. Oh, for sure. Like, literally the day our show is scheduled to record, that literally happened. And, and dude, the article, like I said, when I had found out about that, when I texted you about that, the article that came out with that news, which I think was, like, the local news for that area, came out, like, a half hour before I texted you. So that was, like, that was, like, that was, like, hot coals news right there. That was hot. Good episode. Good episode. What are your closing words, bud? Uh, closing words is, guys, uh, we'll definitely see you next week. Uh, we don't know what's going to be happening, but hopefully we'll have some new, uh, fresher content coming out. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it won't just be the podcast. Hopefully it won't just be a show. Um, I am going to be trying to break this up into uh, digestible uh, videos. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll see how that works. Um but, uh, but yeah, hopefully UFC 249 does come into effect uh, this coming April. But if it doesn't, you know, there's the UFC is not gone for good just yet. And there's always more MMA opportunities uh, for us to cover elsewhere. So that's really all I've got for you guys, Lincoln. You got anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Cut out for a second. I wasn't sure if you were done or not. Oh, no, you're okay. So, I just <laughs> want everybody to get be safe out there and just rewatch some stuff. Read about it. You got time. Oh, yeah. Oh, hope, shit. Hope everything is financially stable and just the world will keep spinning. That, that, the sun's going to tomorrow, guys. That reminds me. I'm glad you said that. Rewatch some fights. Um, something that came out this past week on the UFC's YouTube channel was they released the full fight for, I believe it was on the 21st, so it was five days ago, they re- they, re- they released um, Shogun Hua versus Dan Henderson 2. Great fight. Check that out. That's your home. One of the best fights ever. That is legitimate. That is, for all, for all you guys out there, that's your homework. Go watch it if you haven't seen it at all, and go re-watch it if you've already seen it. It's good stuff. Yep. So we will all definitely right, be... Out there, guys. Yep. Check you guys next week.